So I would like to really thank the organizers for the kind invitation. And I'm actually one of those people who haven't made a quantum leap. So uh, using uh, the words of one of our co-organizers, Dee, and I'm doing like classical for quantum mainly. And uh, this is talk is also about classical for quantum. And also another disclaimer is that these actually made, the, most of these works are done like four or five years ago, so before COVID. And it was the thesis work of my student Yu Cao, who is now a professor at Shanghai Jiao Tong University. So some of the references may be outdated and maybe I have had a chance to include more recent results. And, but in any case, I feel that this may fit the day well because it's open system day, right? So that I want to talk about the blood equations, but mainly from a more of a classical point of view. So uh, I will divide this into uh, two parts, as the title suggests, so that I will talk a little bit about variational structure of linear blood equations, which is more from a prior math point of view, uh, I would say. And then I will talk a little bit about numerical methods, but of course, disclaimer, these are classical numerical methods. While I think some of them may have some connection with quantum methods, as we'll probably see uh, later, I mean, maybe this afternoon by Xian Tao. Um, so yeah, I think I don't need to introduce the linear blood equation again, so that we have seen many, many times the form of this, and which is actually wonderful work by a mathematician Lindblad, who proved that, in fact, if you have a quantum process, like, which is a CPTP, or which is a quantum Markov semigroup, defined as here, so it's CPTP for any time, and then it can be, I mean, written as a semigroup generated by this Lindblad generator. Okay, so this is a complete characterization of uh, quantum semi Markov semigroup, if you like. And then, uh, of course, I mean, the question, I mean, there are, I mean, from a chemistry and a physical point of view, I mean, there is a always a kind of remaining question that what if the system is not really Markovian? Uh, then, I mean, what to add and how to modify and what's the connection of this complete Markovian description with a more general open quantum system descriptions? Okay, so, uh, I mean, maybe I would add a little bit to this uh, like background introduction to Lindblad just to show you a case where these equations can be actually rigorously derived from a more a larger system with a system of bus connections. Okay, so I mean, of course, this is a, again a kind of slide just to sell that Lindblad equation is important. Actually, when we started working on these back then in mathematics, no one knows Lindblad equations, and then I was trying to convince people that it's important so that this audience is perfect. And we've seen connections with uh, quantum computation, but of course in physics, before quantum computing, I mean, they have been used a lot in quantum optics, and also for like in quantum chemistry, they have been used a lot for systems interacting with the environment. Okay, so as I said, I will show you an example that uh, one can derive actually to think about equations in a simple uh, model to, uh, to describe the electron-electron interaction and couple with phonon, so the uh, celebrated anderson hornstein model. And also, I mean, uh, I just may point out that actually in the chemistry world, Many times, actually, people prefer to use red field equation to model these open quantum systems, which has a little bit of memory, and uh, we will see uh, in this context. Uh, I mean, so, yeah, so let me uh, just uh, write down the anderson hornstein model. And as you have seen, I mean, these open quantum systems, in general, the Hamiltonian is written as this, so that we have a system part. Okay, in this case, it just has a classical degree of freedom, so it's like a phonon and with a one electron in a system. Okay, and then you have a bath, which is just a non-interacting harmonic, also, I mean, sorry, non-interacting fermions. Okay, and then there was some coupling, uh, which is a linear coupling in this way. And the, uh, the, I mean, I have non-dimensionalized system so that these parameters, EKs and the BKs, K, by the way, denotes the number of the uh, modes in the phonon. Uh, these are just all the one parameters where the only parameters that uh, kind of vary in the system is the gamma, which is the uh, coupling parameter, uh, indicating how strong the system is coupled with the bath. And also this epsilon, which I mean, because there is a position degree of freedom here, so that epsilon, you can think of this as a reduced Planck constant, and which is also, a, if you're thinking about semi-classical analysis, this is like a semi-classical parameter. When epsilon goes to zero, that so we're thinking that this, degree, this positional degree of freedom becomes more of a classical degree of freedom, okay, instead of quantum. And of course, certainly the evolution of the system, I mean, in the, if you think about this large system, if the closed evolution of the closed system is given by von Neumann equation with this, again, this epsilon comes in because of just because of scaling, because we are also going to think the limit that epsilon goes to zero. And let me say also that this is actually the uh, the place that I get into uh, the linear bar equations because I mean before that I was uh, working on um, uh, for some of people who know me for a long while I was working on mathematical rigorous proofs of surface hopping algorithms. And then I was uh, become a friend with a chemist, Joe Subanek, who worked in the chemistry department at the University of Pennsylvania. And he's been working on these kind of open quantum systems, I mean, field, deriving field equations, 
and try to understand the, the semi-classical limit of these things. And actually, he was the one who suggested this kind of problem to me. So try to mathematically study these things and try to prove some theorems. And so that uh, with a student, with a student U, and then we enter into this field. And then we are realizing that, OK, so maybe if you think about mass the equation, then the first question we ask is that why? I mean, you are using right field equation instead of linear blood equation. OK, so that's. Uh, and then actually, this is kind of like summarized of the relations of between these things. And so um, you see that there are some kind of parameters. So that epsilon, by the way, doesn't have to be small because I mean, it's just indicated as a semi-classical parameter. It could be auto one. Just means that system is not semi-classical at all. OK? And now, it's, I think it's well, though it's already mentioned, um, alluded to in the previous two talks, which set up the very good stage for my talk, is that if you have a weak coupling between the system and Bath, then I mean, the linear blood equation is a good model. And in particular, I mean, even if you want to divide the so-called red field equation, you're based on the same assumption in a way that the gamma, I mean, it's a weak coupling. I mean, so gamma is small. Okay, and then maybe our contribution is to say, I mean, is to realize that actually, if you, if you're in a slightly regime, a slightly more stringent condition than this one is that gamma square is less than epsilon, then actually you can collapse the red field equation into linear blood, so that you don't need. So in some sense, you can think of that this coupling is even weaker. Okay, you can actually go to the linear blood equation. And now, if you from a chemical point of view, or from a chemistry point of view, so that if you want to simulate these things, not on a quantum computer, on a classical computer, so you want to reduce these things to classical equations, and so you want to take also the semi-classical limit, the epsilon goes to zero. And then what happens in that regime is that if you send the epsilon to zero, then actually these conditions become collapsed. So that no matter which regime you're thinking that, I mean, in the semi-classical regime, actually linear blood equation and red field equation describe the same thing. So that, I mean, so there was no actual advantage if you're thinking about semi-classical regime to use one way or another. So that, I mean, so this is what we call linear blood in classical mass, uh, master equation. Okay, so CME stands for classical master equation, that, which is kind of a focal Planck equation, by the way. I mean, so for those of you who are familiar with uh, uh, focal Planck, please. So for this model models, what kind of physics? It's a kind of electron-electron interaction. So there's an electron with the path, and then electron is coupling with the with a uh, phonon in the lattice. Okay. All right. So yeah, just to summarize the kind of main result, I don't want to go into the proof. And um, this is just to serve as an introduction of where linear blood equation can comes from. So that I mean, so I mean, here we can derive that. I mean, if you only consider the partial trace that of the whole density matrix on the system, then the uh, system. Um, uh, that's the matrix satisfied the linear blood equation, as you can imagine. And the only thing that I want to point out is maybe that you see this parameter here, <laughs> which sort of describes how large the coupling with the bath is, right? Because this is a dissipated part of the of the generator, and so that this is actually where the small parameter comes in. So that the gamma square is less than zeta square is less than epsilon condition. And then also there was something that I want to point out is that actually there was a kind of correction of the Hamiltonian term if you go which is the feedback of the bath has two parts. One is the correction of Hamiltonian of the system, and another is the correction of the, of course, the coupling with the bath as a dissipative operator. Okay, and I mean, I have already mentioned this, so that actually the condition to arrive, at in, in some sense, is kind of redundant, so that if you have a semi-classical regime, that they are actually on the same level of approximations, and we actually verify this also numerically and also predictively that, I mean, at least in this case, red field doesn't really add much chemistry to the system, to the description of the system. Okay, and also, I mean, because we are interested in semi-classical limits, we actually, I mean, we also derive the uh, semi-classical limit, linear blood and classical mass equation using uh, the, I mean, the usual procedure, the working transformation and taking the limits. Okay, so this is just the introduction, so let me come to uh, the D. Yeah. Oh, I mean, <laughs> I, can, I don't remember the exact expression, but I mean, something coming from here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that, this is like, uh, I mean, because this is structure theorem is guaranteed by linear blocks, right? So that, uh, I, mean, every, I mean, in the end of the day, it has to be that form. And what does Redfield add on top of that? I mean, well, my claim is that for this system, it doesn't add much. <laughs> so, I mean, you should just use linear block. Okay, so now let me come to the main part of the talk. So that one thing is that I want to... Um, I mean, of our motivation is that uh, coming from more of classical sampling or classical variational uh, calculus community. So, I mean, I, I mean, sort of one thing that is well known that in the classical uh, kind of uh, applied math and also being uh, used really, I mean, I've found many, many use applications in machine learning these days is so-called uh, this uh, kind of grain flow perspective of the dynamics. Okay, so um, 
maybe for those of you who are less familiar with these things, so this is just a very brief history of what this uh, kind of, uh, kind of uh, interpretation uh, is. So the, the, uh, the first paper or the first interpretation comes from the celebrate groundbreaking work by Jordan Kinderreicher and Otto in 1998, who realized that actually you can view the Fock Planck equation, which is the master equation of the over damp Langevin process, as the gradient flow in the Wasserstein metric of, I mean, of, uh, of the relative entropy. Okay? And this point of view, I mean, because thinking of this as an I mean, infinite dimensional system as a green flow, okay, really kind of opens the door for many things. And in particular, for example, algorithms interpretation of these things that uh, and, I mean, you can use GKO as a numerical scheme. And also, in particular, it actually can, I mean, create a uh, very easy framework to show the exponential convergence of these uh, green flows through entropy production formulas. Okay. So, uh, so yeah, this is just a uh, review of this history. This on this side is the I mean people realizing gradient flow structures of various equations. I mean, first starting from heat equation, fock plan equation, and then to non more nonlinear equations like Powers median, and then I mean, of course, I made a lot of works in between. I mean, this has been a very large field, and then uh, I mean, I think more related to our work is that Young Mas, I mean, back in 2011, realizing that you can also uh, kind of derive, I mean, kind of realizing this gradient flow structure for discrete Markov chains. Okay, so uh, I mean these are continuous uh, continuous Markov jump processes to some extent, and but you can also uh, realizing these for discrete things, and then I mean uh, in the work by uh, Eric Carlin and Young Mas, they realized that actually the quantum master uh, equation, the Lindblad equation, can also be thought of as a gradient flow uh, under of course a different slightly different geometric structure. Okay, and then uh, I mean we are I mean we are motivated by the, this work by uh, Eric Carlin and Young Mas. We are visiting. Uh, we are thinking about uh, the gradient structure of the linear blood equation, and then as a side product, actually, we realize that Fock Planck actually has more gradient flow structures than the original paper that had been realized. And for example, it has, it can, you can interpret Fock Planck as the gradient flow in different, uh, in different energy with respect to different geometries. And it turns out that actually this interpretation is useful for, uh, so for some algorithms which have been used later uh, to prove some bounds in theoretical machine learning. Okay, and as I also as I said, that many of these things can be used to show the exponential convergence or the mixing. In other words, I'm referring to the previous talk of these uh, of these equations, and in particular here is just a list of some of the works. Okay, uh, I mean I focus more on the linear blood equations, but I've, I I think I missed some of the more recent results. I mean on the exponential convergence of linear blood equations. Okay, so let me maybe uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with quantum information here, but let me just give you a slight introduction because I, mean, I need to specify what is the energy here, and because I want to talk about gradient flow, and you talk about the energy, okay, I need to talk about the geometry or the metric, okay. So for the energy, I mean I guess it's sort of uh, clear that I mean from a quantum information perspective that we are t we are t talking about some kind of relative entropy, okay. And of course, the most probably most familiar one is the uh, this direct generalization by von Neumann of the classical uh, entropy. Okay, so that I mean, this is relative entropy between rho and the sigma. Okay, and I just quote from the book by Wild that this actually plays a very important role in the quantum information theory, and there are many many things that is related with the understanding of the entropy. And for our purpose, I want to introduce a slightly different metric. Okay, which is called sandwich Rene divergence. Okay, which is written as this, which is actually kind of related with the, what the, uh, the detailed balance condition that uh, Anthony introduced the last time. So that you see, if you remember the formula, you see the root row was multiplied on both the starting and end. This is actually kind of a sandwich way to think about detailed balance. And this is actually coming kind of related with this, uh, this way of thinking about divergence. And now you may ask, okay, why <laughs> in this way? They're very complicated, right, with R phi and so on. This is just because, I mean, the sigma and the rho, you can think of them in five dimension. These are just two matrices, right? So that in the classical world, if we multiply by two numbers, it doesn't really matter which way that you multiply them. I mean, so because they commute. While in the quantum world, the things do not commute, so that actually the way that you multiply them is important. In particular, if they commute, then they actually just fall back to this formula, which is uh, which might look more familiar from a classical point of view, but also in a quantum point of view, I mean, this is Rennie divergence from a classical point of view, and quantum lay, this is called Pat's Rennie divergence. Okay, it's one version of the Rennie divergence where you put rho in front of sigma, but I mean, more, I mean, more friendly is that you use this so-called sandwiched version so that you sandwich sigma uh, by rows. Okay, and just uh, may remark that I mean, for the sandwich range divergence, when alpha goes to one, it falls back to so-called quantum relative entropy. Okay, and then when alpha two, it is related with the chi-square divergence. 
Okay, of, of, I mean, this is the quantum version of the chi squared divergence, I mean, of the, uh, which is L2 distances between rho and sigma. And then when alpha you put to half, this is related with the fidelity. So that this is a whole family of kind of metric that you can use to measure the difference of two uh, quantum state. Okay, and also maybe it's good to mention that, I mean, so that these entropy, I mean, these uh, divergences satisfy the data, so-called data processing inequality when alpha is greater than half. So this is proved by Rupert Frank and Ali Leap back in 2013, which means that if you have two quantum channels and if you apply them, then, then the divergence between the state after the channel is smaller than the divergence before the channel, which is sort of intuitive because when you apply some quantum channel, you sort of mix the state together, so it becomes less distinguishable compared with the uh, original state, okay? All right, so now let me introduce the grain flow. So, uh, I mean, just wondering like, how many of you in the audience have know what a grain flow is? Okay, uh, not too many, <laughs> yeah, going slowly a little bit. So, I mean, maybe the purpose of talk is really to bridge the gap between applied mathematicians and uh, some quantum scientists. So, I mean, the grain flow, as I said, has been used quite a lot in applied math, and so the basic idea is the following. So let's suppose that, I mean, just very abstractly, suppose that we have some kind of remaining manifold with some metric specified attention space, and we're thinking about a given energy function, and in the energy function we through with the previous divergence is going to be the, I mean, in our case, it's going to be the sandwich many divergence, okay? And then we're thinking about the gradient, okay? So then, I mean, the question is how you define this gradient, okay? I mean, of course, on the Euclidean space, everyone know that the gradient is defined just by taking the partial derivative of the energy with respect to each direction and put them as a vector. That's the gradient. That's what we use in gradient descent in SGD, I mean, algorithms, right? But I mean, in, in this case, on the manifold with a metric, you define a gradient in this way. So you think about an infinitesimal movement, okay, starting from the state, which is a row, and you move in some direction on a tangent space, okay? And you, take it, you do an infinitesimal move and you compare the energy difference. You take a derivative with back to the, uh, the amount of movement, and you call that the gradient I mean, in that direction under this metric. Okay, so by the way, the, the left-hand side here is a number, right? So that this is defined for any, every v, okay? So this is a number. So in some sense, you, you, you define this vector in a duality way. Okay? You define the vector as prescribing by its inner product with any other vector in tangent space, okay? And the prescription of this uh, inner product is given by the change of energy if you're going infinitesimal in the right direction, okay? And then if you define like this, the green flow is just an active direction of the evolution, please. Manifold is just a set of density operator. Uh, I mean, in later on, yes, but here it can be anything, so it's just a general structure. Yes, please. Uh, so is E a function on the manifold? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So what is the meaning of E of rho plus epsilon v? Because it's e so, plus yeah, so yeah, so yeah, that's a very good question. So here you're thinking of some kind of exponential maps, so, I mean, so that allows you this. Yeah, sorry for the note. I mean, I'm a bit sloppy in the notation here. Is this the same as like the first exterior derivative of this function? Uh, sorry, I didn't hear. Is this the same as the... First exterior derivative of this function? First exterior derivative yeah. of the function? Yeah. Uh, not necessary, so that, I mean, because it may of the inner product here. Okay. All that, yeah. Okay, so now let's be more specific and let's take, I mean, the, um, the thing and then, I mean, you can easily calculate that what's the derivative of this thing, I mean, slightly, so that it's, it's going to be the inner product of the functional derivative of the divergence with back to rho with some vector, okay? And then you take it in the inner product so that I want to define the gradient as this. Okay, but of course, I mean, using like a Ries representation theorem, you can always rewrite this gradient as an operator. That I mean, so that I can define the operator such that maps the vector, okay, b into some something as some another vector, so that it respects the uh, it gives you the inner product. Okay, so I mean, this is just a Ries representation theorem on the tangent space. And now, if you re use the Ries representation theorem, so that I mean, I just uh, rewrite this thing as the as this operator acting on the gradient, I mean, acting on this gradient e. And what I will get, I mean, by this, I know that this is given by differential. So if you, I mean, if you forget about the differential geometry or things like that, so in general, the gradient of the energy is just given by some operator, okay? Which, by the way, because it's induced by the metric, so this operator has to be strictly positive definite, okay? And the gradient is just some operator and acting on this, I mean, kind of functional derivative, which is probably uh, what you mean by the exterior derivative, okay? And then. So now, if you define this as the gradient, then certainly the flow is just given by, I mean, the, uh, the, the derivative, the time derivative is given the negative direction of the gradient, okay? So this is just a, uh, I mean, recap of the gradient flow. And now the question is that we want to establish, or we want to ask, 
in what sense the linear blood equation is a gradient flow? Because we sort of know that it's a CPTP map, it dissipates things. So we expect that if there is no Hamiltonian term, if there is no driving of the system, then it is a gradient flow, right? It dissipates something. Okay, so we want to, I mean, so which means that if we want to establish the gradient flow, what we need to do is that because the row dot, we know that it's given by the generator, okay, L dagger, and we want to find the structure, or we want to find a metric, so that, I mean, uh, in, in equivalent to, we want to find this operator so that the L dagger can be written in this way, okay? So this, I mean, this in some sense, this is also how classically, I mean, people, I mean, the JKO discovered that the Bartoshtan metric is the natural metric because they do the same calculation and uh, they, they realize the Fisher information and then they try to invert that and it becomes Bartoshtan metric. Okay, that's the infinitesimal definition of the Bartoshtan metric. All right, so, any question? So to, oh, yes. Uh, so should we think of the gradient as a vector field or is it something that is not like a vector field? Uh, you can think of it as a vector field and manifold, so each point you give it a direction. Yeah. So that um, tells you how it evolves. Okay. So now, I mean, to state our theorem, I need to also go back to this discussion of the quantum detail balance that uh, Anthony already mentioned, which is, I mean, I hope, I mean, it didn't bore you with these uh, uh, detail balance conditions, so that, I mean, everyone knows the classical detail balance condition, I hope, so which means that the, if you have a property measure, if you have a transition probability from x to y, and it doesn't matter if you go from x to y or going from y to x. Okay, and now one of the equivalent way of thinking about this is to look at the Euclid form. So if you think about the Euclid form, that means that inner product of some two functions and sandwiched by this Markov generator, a Markov semigroup, and inner product with respect to the pi, which is the invariant measure, is symmetric. Okay, so because the symmetry, it automatically infers that the, all the eigenvalues of the matrix is real, right? So that this is nice thing, and then in fact you can, with a little bit more proof, you can show that I mean, for this classical Markov group, I mean, Markov matrices and all the eigenvalues are between magnitude one and one, so that if you exponentiate them, they will converge to the uh, equilibrium state, okay? And where, I mean, this is just a weighted inner product, all right? So now, I mean, as, I mean, when we first enter into this game and we are thinking, okay, so let's just generalize this to the quantum case, right? How hard it is. So, I mean, we want to generate, right? So let's generate this formula. So we have the semi-group and uh, Lindeblatt, right? Lindeblatt has this generator, PT, okay? Uh, sorry, semi-group, not generator. <laughs> this is generator. And, but what I'm trying to say is that, I mean, it's equivalent with saying that a generator is also symmetric with some kind of metric, okay? And this metric, in some sense, has to be the product of the invariant measure. Right, and in the linear case, is the thermal state, the sigma. Okay, so in some sense, this is some sigma that's involved. I mean, that's why I use a smiley face here because I do not know what it is at the moment. I, mean, I think it's easy, right? And trace of some a inner product with b. I mean, by the way, the inner product we're thinking of some weighted version of the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. I mean, Hilbert-Schmidt inner product, so that this is. I mean, one, one wants to insert sigma somewhere here, right, or pi somewhere here. But then, I mean, again, we are hit by this issue that in the quantum world, we are have dealing with matrices so that they do not commute, right? So that, I mean, in the classical world, there was really no way to, I mean, other, no other way to multiply pi. Right? You cannot, I mean, you cannot imagine another way to multiply this inner measure here. In the quantum layer, I want to multiply sigma, but I mean, in what sense am I multiplying sigma, okay? And now this, I mean, comes, I mean, it's back a little bit to this form of that. I mean, we can expand into a basis and then we can think about this multiplication just generically as multiply some number with this basis expansion of, I mean, of B or of A, right? And now it turns out that depending on how you choose things, I mean, you have actually many, many ways of many variants of the detailed balance conditions and all of them are associated with uh, great names, okay? So for example, the GNS detail balance, okay? And I don't want to go into I mean, all these details, okay? BKM I mean, and so on and so forth. And by the way, this is also related with the geometry that we need to talk about in the gradient flow. And so, I mean, there are many, many of them. I mean, you, if you're not an expert in quantum information, you don't need to care about all of these things. And then what we realized that, I mean, or what we found is that for the uh, sandwich re, uh, rainy divergence, you need to use the detail balance. Uh, for the detail balance, actually, you need to define this way, which, I mean, I will forget about details later on. We'll just denote as W sigma alpha. So, so, but what is the invariant measure here? Is it it, it's some invariant measure that you think is a thermal state correspond to lean blood equation. I mean, you're talking about, by the way, you're talking about detailed balance, even in the classical case, right? You're talking about with back to the invariant measure of the Markov chain. So it's the same thing in the quantum world, so that you can think of this as a quantum version of generalization of the Markov chain. So this is the, I mean, the station distribution of the symbolic. Yes, but, yes, it's position okay. point. But, but somehow, but, yeah, but does it, can you characterize it here? Or 
No, even in the classical case, you cannot characterize it, right? Mm -hmm. Even in a classical case, you can say that, of course, it's the eigenvector of the Markov transition matrix with eigenvalue one. You can say the same thing in the quantum case, but it's okay. not going to be explicit. And I think, I mean, the contribution of the previous two talk is to construct a uh, explicit linear blood equation so that you know exactly what's the uh, thermal state. I mean, that you, can, you want to construct, right? So that's, that's the point. So in general, it's a, I mean, given a linear blood equation, it's actually very hard to written down what's the thermal state. I mean, also, in the, even in a classical case, so that's not a quantum problem. It's, it's just a hard problem. <laughs> okay? So now, I mean, so one thing that we have uh, identified is that, I mean, uh, which is perhaps not so surprising if you have hear, heard the first talk, is that if you want this linear blood equation to be a green flow, in other words, you want it to converge or I mean, descent, it has to satisfy the balance condition. Right? I mean, of course, classical, condition, classical equivalent of the theorem is kind of obvious, right? So that if you want Markov chain to mixing, like a, or like value is zero, sorry, or real, and it's only dissipative, there is no rotation, then it has to be detail balanced. Good question? So to, to, to reiterate, you, you mean that the choice of detailed balance, you know, there's so many choice. They're just because you want to use them to prove particular kind of convergence. Mm -hmm. Is that the... So you're meaning the relation between them? Actually, this yes. diagram you shows that relation. So some of them is stronger, some of them is uh, weaker. So the, for example, KMS detailed balance is weaker than the detailed balance we have, which is uh, weaker than the so-called uh, Gaffand, uh, they mark uh, Schwinger detailed balance. So, uh, uh, sorry, Sago detailed balance. And what do they help you? Like the choice of that helps improve things, or help you? No, the it's, the point is that I mean, for example, if you give me a linear blood equation, right? And if it's, I mean, if I want to say that it's a gradient flow under the, for example, for the Rennie divergence, so I want to say that Rennie divergence the case exponentially, like gradient flow, then it has to be detail balanced with this metric. So if if you detail balance with KMS, it's not it's in general not enough. So that's the kind of the statement. That's a necessary a necessary statement. So you're saying that if you have detailed balance, then the proof becomes positive? Like, it, no, it's a necessary condition. So if it is not detailed balance, then it's not a gradient flow. Then it would be harder to prove convergence. Uh, yeah, it's a, I mean, sure. I mean, in a classical case, I mean, if for a Markov chain is not a gradient flow, I mean, it's not a detailed balance, I mean, it still can be ergodic, right? I mean, a, I mean, there are many, many examples here. I, I mean, for example, the famous, most, maybe well-known example to physics is the underdamped Langevin equation. So it's the it's this equation, right? So that uh, I mean, so the usual dump under that over damp Langevin is this one, okay? Where this is a Brownian motion, and the under damp Langevin is this, So this is a, I mean, this is the Hamiltonian part. So this is actually very, this is very similar to linear blood equation with a, with a Hamiltonian. So this is the Hamiltonian part, okay? And this is the dissipative part. And this equation, this dynamics is not detail balanced. But for sure, it converges to the, uh, the, the measure that we think it should converge to. And actually to prove, I mean, I will I maybe come back to a little bit. Actually to prove the rate of this convergence to the, uh, to the uh, exact uh, the invariant measure is actually an open problem. And this actually motivates our study and we sort of resolve it. So through our kind of thinking about uh, L2 convergence of these things. So you classically, you, you, suppose you have, you, you, have the, you have the equation and you have the equilibrium measure. From the equilibrium measure, there's only one definition of the data balance. Mm -hmm. yeah. Here you also have your equation. You yeah. have the equilibrium measure, presumably, yes. from the link equation. Yes. And then, you, I mean, isn't, it seems like there should be only one definition of data balance. So why do you have so many? Um, I mean, because it's, it's just because like what metric that you're using, right? So that, I mean, in some sense, which way that you're thinking about this geometry of the state of density matrices. And because the geometry is unclear, like because there was no clear way to think about, I mean, there are many versions of non-commutative L2 spaces, for example. So that's why, I mean, it, it ends up with different choices. But still, I mean, there, there are actually some connection between them. It's not that they are totally wild different. And some of them is a most stringent. And then, for example, I mean, I should mention that this, the result of this actually was also inspired by the work by Colin and Moss. And they've shown that if you have GMS detail balance, then you can show that in the blood equation is a gradient flow of the relative entropy, of the quantum relative entropy. And we are sort of generalized their results to a more wide class of detail, uh, sorry, metric, which in, I mean, the use of that is that for some metric, Maybe it's slightly easier to prove the convergence. 
So as, as a result, I mean, we don't have a result in quantum, but I mean, for example, I mean, classically, this, if you want to show relative entropy decay for this, is hard. But for L2, for chi-square divergence decay, it's sort of one, one can resolve that with sharp rates. Yes? Yeah, so, uh, so here, even you show the uh, Lindbergh equation as a gradient flow, you still uh, need the other steps to choose. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, of course, I mean, I'll come back to that uh, <laughs> the last part. So this is a necessary condition, and by the way, this paper is published in a special journal that dedicated to Eugene Wigner, so that we are happy. And, <laughs> and um, so, yeah, so that, I mean, that is what I claim. All right, and now, uh, I mean, I also, we also show the, uh, the sufficient condition, so that, I mean, as long as they satisfy the detailed balance, then, I mean, one can, one can construct a remaining manifold such that the, uh, the, the grain flow of this, uh, with this of, the, uh, sorry, of the sandwich many divergence with respect to this metric is given by linear blood equation. So to some extent, is some, in some sense, linear blood equation is just the infinite dimensional version of the grain flow, of the grain descent that we are kind of like in optimization. Uh, going down in terms of the, I mean, so in some sense it converges to the thermal state. Okay? And uh, so, yeah, I mean, then, uh, I mean, we can, yeah, I, mean, I think Lin was asking about the form of the uh, linear product operator. I mean, this is the, the form that one can come up with here and so on. So, but I mean, I don't want to go into the uh, details of form. Okay? So let me come back to GN's question. What are those VJs? Uh, the VJ are some jump operators that I mean, we need to address that by these omegas. Uh, yeah, they are given. Right? I mean, you're, you're specifying in by equation to me. I want to find a metric. Yeah. Um, quick question. Uh, so, so in this slide, in this existence proof, which part is the difficult part? So you are saying there is a Riemannian manifold. So what kind of things are easy in that proof? Uh, I think it's the difficult part just to identify the geometry. So, for example, we need to figure out what is the what does it mean by uh, detail balance. And that, what's the connection of that with the geometry? And then to establish that this is the grain flow under that geometry. So the Riemannian metric is the thing that is hard. Uh, yeah, I think finding that is kind of, I mean, to, to realizing uh, that what's the underlying geometry if you want to establish the grain flow for the entropy. I think that's the interesting part. And this has been also kind of uh, replicated uh, in other contexts in machine learning for some other metrics and other functionals so that it's been always like this procedure, so that you want to show something is decay, you want to identify the energy. Energy is sort of usually easy because you want to say that it goes to zero, right? And the, the, often the trick is to, how, I mean, often the difficulty part is to identify the geometry. So this is, uh, yeah, it's in general, I think. But the topological aspects of the manifold are easy, like, like. Oh, we, we didn't study that. So I mean, it's a very interesting problem, but I mean, yeah, we didn't go into that. I mean, it's, it's a very, so for those of you who are not in the <laughs> green flow community, so that, I mean, in some sense, one nice contribution of GQ is that identify the Wachstein metric, and then you can study, start to study this infinite dimensional manifold given by probability with that metric, and that's a very interesting story, and connecting with Fields metals, and, but I mean, we're, we're not going to that for this, uh, in this direction yet. And in fact, I mean, I should also mention that this is also like the major part of the work. I mean, all the groundbreaking by Eric Carlin and Jan Maas to identify this geometry of the, uh, of the G, uh, GNS geometry that associated with density matrix. So that in blood equation is a grain flow under that metric. Yeah, we are trying to generalize this a little bit. Yeah, but I mean, it's, which is, but it's heavily influenced by that work. Okay, so yeah, so I mean, and as I said, I mean, one of the moments of wishing to, to establish this grain flow structure is really trying to think about exponential convergence. And so, I mean, so let me just also kind of review the usual way of using the entropy production to show the convergence, so that, I mean, which is kind of very similar to so-called energy method in the PDE, so that you just differentiate what you want to show to be convergent, and you get one hand side. In a classical case, I mean, for focal point equation, this is the Fisher information. In a quantum case, this is some kind of quantum Fisher information. Uh, I mean, so this is the quantum relative alpha Fisher information because we're using this alpha Rene divergence. Okay, and now uh, once you establish this thing, then, I mean, if you can get some functional quality of the right-hand side with respect to E, okay, then you're in good shape. So in particular, if you, I mean, in a classical case, this is known as operative inequality, so you can show that if the right-hand side is bounded from below by some linear constant times the left-hand side, okay, then you get exponential decay. You can do some, a little bit more general than this, so for if you can establish a functional relation with not only the linear, but some kind of algebraic with some power, then you can establish algebraic decay of the relative entropy, okay? And as, as I already mentioned that, I mean, if you have a Hamiltonian in the linear blood equation 
uh, the, the coherence term, or if, for example, in on-damp Langevin, you have something like this, then the technique is different. So that one needs to use some other things, so-called hypercoercivity in the classical literature. And in the quantum, I don't think this is developed yet. But maybe now it's a time to, because there are so many interest in the convergence of linear blood equations, so maybe there is time to develop the hypercoercivity for linear blood equations. Okay, so, and then, uh, as I said, I mean, so, before us, there was a work by, uh, from quantum information by Müller Hermes and Franca, who shows that, I mean, which is, uh, of course, that if you assume that, I mean, the system has satisfied the quantum alpha LSI, the log subtle inequality, which is this, then you have exponential convergence. And you see that this, I mean, the proof of this is actually quite easy. I mean, it's just inserting this into the, differ the differentiation, and because we know that it's a green flow, so that right-hand side is given by the relative inf uh, the Fisher information, and then you're just inserting this, and then you use the Huawei inequality. Okay? Uh, now, I mean, we actually, I mean, the way that, I mean, the reason that we enter into this is that we realize that this is actually not sharp. Okay? So it's, it's an inequality that is good for all time, but does not characterize the symptomatic behavior. Okay, so in particular, this will predict that for alpha larger, that this is actually the case slower because the K alpha has a monotonicity relation. Okay, so, but I mean, in numerical simulations, it's also easy to see that actually the asymptotic decay rate, even though that initially, the decay of the alpha Rene divergence is slightly different, but asymptotically, the rate is the same, and which is actually governed by the spectral gap of the generator. Okay, so now in, I mean, for this, and so that, I mean, in our paper, we just established a, uh, yeah, so we will try to establish that, I mean, close this gap, so that we'll try to understand the symptomatic behavior of these alpha range divergence with respect to the spectral gap. And for that, I mean, we are sort of, I mean, this is a new version of the kind of functional sublift inequality that we are able to prove, which is, I mean, for the uh, uh, for two case, when you two, which is, of course, related with the chi-square. Previous slide, the goal is to converge to the temperature state. No, it's a, it's a thermal state given by here. I mean, thermal state is this one, so that, I mean, in, in this particular case, it is this uh, maximum uh, equilibrium state, but then you can, uh, you can take another example, where, can, where be, uh, sigma will be slightly different. But uh, there is, by choosing this particular sigma, that's... No, no, it, it's just a numerical example. Yeah, so that we can, I mean, it's two by two, so that we can, cap we can compute. <laughs> yeah, it may, it, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't want to interpret this physically because I mean, we don't have a Hamiltonian, by the way, because we only study detailed balanced ones. So that, I mean, these, these are only jump operators. And then, yeah, just the, by choice that this is the thermal state. Okay, and now, uh, yeah, maybe I should speed up a little bit. That, I mean, so, I mean, but in short, we, and because I still want to talk a little bit about yeah, the, uh, the numerics, uh, so that, I mean, in any case, we, have, we can establish the sharp decay, I mean, asymptotic decay of these uh, random divergence, I mean, for. Uh, D equal to two, and also, I mean, uh, using monotonicity, using comparison formula, which also holds, uh, by the way, for classical uh, divergence, uh, that we can we extend the result for two to alpha, so that we can uh, show the expansion, uh, symptotic expansion decay. Okay, so which sharp decay of these uh, of the uh, mixing time in a way. All right, so um, I think I need to stop at uh, in ten minutes. Uh, Fifteen minutes. Okay, so maybe I'll use 10 and then. So let me try to, um, yeah, because I want to speak about this part because it's sort of connected with Andras' talk, and which of course this is classical and what he has done is quantum. So uh, yeah, we, I mean, so now we were asking our question that, I mean, uh, how can we simulate it? But back then we don't, I mean, it, it was actually before the surge of the activity around quantum computing applied math, though we're not even thinking about quantum computers, so we are just thinking about how to classically simulate lean blood equations, okay? And now, I mean, uh, starting uh, from the kind of uh, training or perspective from numerical analysis, so one of the motif is that we want to derive numerical schemes that kind of uh, respect the physical properties. Okay, so in the, I mean, to respect the properties of the continuous dynamics. And as we have seen that uh, this implied equation has nice properties, it's a green flow, okay? So we can use JKO, but, I mean, that, but that's costly, okay? But also, I mean, more importantly from a physical point of view, I guess, is the CPTP property of the linear blood equations. It's a complete positive and trace preserving. So the question for us is that, okay, so if we want to solve numerically, and also, of course, we are not the first people to think about solving it numerically, and so what are schemes that can be structure preserving in a way that, because you're discretizing it, you're making approximations, but you want the approximate scheme still respect the CPTP property, okay? even though they may not be exact state. Okay, you have numerical error, but you want the approximate state is still a physical state. 
Okay, and now we start to look dig into literature, and in the literature, I mean, people have developed many methods, numerical methods solved linear bound equations, mostly by physicists. And so there are many methods based on the Kuta ideas, or Taylor, I mean, so it's basically just view this as ODE and to discretize them, and our Taylor theories, and then, uh, I mean, of course, these things are not, uh, in general, they are not uh, uh, physical, okay, so they are not preserving the structure. And then there was also an idea of, uh, I mean, because you can think about, you just want to approximate exponential map of this operator, of, of this matrix, super operator, and then you can do pate of the exponential map. And unfortunately, that also, I mean, this is kind of a popular method, but unfortunately, this is also not physical. Okay? And then we come across to the splitting methods. I mean, I, I, I will expand a little bit. Okay? And then, there was, of course, a huge class of the so-called unraveling approaches. So that instead of solving linear blood, you, you start, you, you go back to the state, you write down the stochastic Schrodinger equation, where the expectation of the vector gives you the density matrices that respect linear blood equations. So these are monocolor approaches. So that I mean, uh, I mean, I would maybe give, if, uh, have, if I have time, I will talk about them a little bit. But our goal, I mean, here is that we want to develop, first of all, a deterministic approach. So we restrict ourselves to this class, which seems to be kind of difficult to develop. Actually, uh, I mean, by the way, I forgot to mention, but I mean, if you do unraveling, that is automatic uh, CPTP because, I mean, because just by construction. So that there was a, a, no question asked. But then, of course, it's a stochastic approach so that it has its own drawback. So, for example, you need to do Monte Carlo averages, and then usually you cannot do high order schemes as well. So, I mean, our motivation is that we want to ask whether we can do high order schemes, and which is also uh, structure preserving and systematic. Okay? So uh, now let me talk about splitting. Uh, actually, I mean, we realize that splitting is probably the most easiest way to, a route to achieve structure preserving because you can split into different parts which respect the physical properties, okay? So I guess the most naive splitting is, as what Andras talked about, is this one. So that you start, you split the, uh, the coherence part, the coherence part, and also the dissipated part, okay? And then you do, uh, you do uh, splitting. And there is some difficulty about this. First of all, you need to exponential matrices. Okay, of course, in quantum, this is probably not a problem. We can do quantum signal processing, but for classically, I mean, if the problem is that if you want to approximate exponential matrices, I mean, if you do it naively, then it will destroy the property. You will destroy the positivity of the CCP property of the, of the approximation. And another thing is that if you want to do high order, which is also mentioned by Andras, is that if you do, if you do arbitrary high order, then the coefficient will become negative. Okay, so I, I think it's also related to what the question was talked about. I mean, you, that's why he stopped at fourth order. I mean, if you go to high order, then it becomes unstable, which in our case will also destroy the complete positivity. Okay, so that's why we actually, even though I mean, it's kind of obvious start, but actually we, we, we change to another alternative splitting, which is, I mean, kind of, it's, maybe it's new in this kind of context, but it's also kind of inspired by unraveling approaches. Because you see that, I mean, from unraveling, this is kind of the splitting that you want to use. So, and this new splitting is just that we put this term with the K term, merge that with the Hamiltonian, okay? And but, but because of that, we need to add this thing, okay? I divided by two I, okay? And this is I mean, so-called effective Hamiltonian, and so that this is the term that from effective Hamiltonian, and then we only kind of keep this part, and which I mean, I guess from uh, if, if for people who come from quantum information background, this is the cross operator form of this LK acting a role, right? So this is a cross operator. And then we realized that actually the nice thing, oh, sorry, this should be little l. The nice thing for this uh, splitting is that we can also show that the exponential of this thing, the Lj, is also cross operator. So we can exponential the matrix, and then we are uh, supplying this. I mean, the j is this bit divided here. Okay, and because of that, so that we have this, I mean, the splitting is kind of what we want in a certain sense that if we do not exponentiate this, this is a cross. If we exponentiate this, this is also cross. So now the question just becomes a representation that we use the exponential of Lj and the primitive form of LL to represent a solution. And now, I mean, for those who are familiar with OD, this is probably a very e easy answer, just using Duhamel's principle, right? So or using, uh, uh, I, mean, I don't know, variation coefficient, uh, coefficients method. Okay, so that this is the, uh, the semi-group that generated by LJ, and this is the, uh, this is Duhamel on the right-hand side, so that is the LL, but I mean, remember that this is a cross, so that this is completely positive. This is also cross, this is also completely positive. So by construction, this method, I mean, if you just do a discretization of this and use this as a method, this is automatically CPTP, okay? And now, um, yeah, this is what I said. And then, of course, you need to kind of uh, approximate this exponential, which I said, I mean, on a classical computer, you cannot just do that, right? I mean, it's, it's super expensive. And now what we do is that we just do a Taylor expansion and then represent the cross form. 
and then uh, because of its form, then it's, uh, it's cross. And now this is CPTP. Oh, cross form just means that this is the, this acting on a matrix. Acting on matrix is equal to J dagger A, sorry, A J dagger. So. All right. And now as advantage of the structure preserving, and maybe I want, I mean, for numerical analysis, this is not surprising that, I mean, in general, for numerical solve of OD, you get grown well in qualities and exponential growth decay, uh, grow. But for structure preserving, you can expect linear growth of error, and this is what we can show, so that you have linear growth of error times H of M. And now, if you're interested in numerically solving linear block equation from a classical point of view, I mean, we have um, um, additional results in that paper. For example, we talk about stability of these equations. I mean, from a kind of numerical analysis point of view, what's the absolute stability of these equations and so on. But I mean, but if you're not interested, I will not go into there. Uh, yeah, maybe I will not talk about detail of this, but let me just give you another, uh, another work that um, uh, done by Yu, which was the question that, sorry. So the previous method, numerical methods, Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is CPTP. Yeah, this is a, yeah, this is automatic CPTP. I mean, the TP is just normalized. TP is easy, but this is on automatic CP. Hmm? No. Uh, well, I mean, you can do numerical analysis, but we haven't done. I mean, most of these methods they, they didn't care about numerical analysis. Uh, so I mean, you can do it, but I mean, uh, but I mean, to get an exponential bound is easy, right? So. <laughs> yeah. 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 So it's, it satisfies maximum principle, in other words. Okay, so yeah, I think because I don't have much time, so that, I mean, I just mentioned that, I mean, in the classical world, there was a very popular way to solve linear value equations by stochastic unraveling. So it's a Monte Carlo approach, and it's approximate rho t by the expectation of some wave functions, and then you develop, you write down some stochastic equations for psi t, which could involve personal noise or diffusion noise, so they call different type of unraveling. And then uh, what, if you take expectation and give it into rho t, this is also kind of similar to some of these quantum Monte Carlo, uh, Monte -Carlo methods that uh, developed recently in the quantum commuting uh, community. And now also in the, it's a very, uh, we have seen a couple of times in the workshop, it's also very kind of uh, uh, popular idea in uh, classical numerical analysis is trying to do low rank approximations of the density matrices, okay? And now, I mean, our work is sort of kind of, um, Really, uh, kind of inspired by some pioneer work by Claude Brice, and for the mathematicians in the, world, uh, in the room who may recognize them, and with Rouchon. And um, the, so they developed for some efficient algorithm, uh, algorithms for linear value equation using these ideas of low rank decomposition and approximate density matrix by some low rank things. And then what they've done is that, I mean, they kind of develop a I mean, unraveling of so Monte Carlo for these uh, low rank dynamics. So the question we ask is essentially that whether this diagram is commute, right? So that if we first unravel and then what's, what we mean by this low rank decomposition on the stochastic level, okay? So that, I mean, for SDE, what do we mean? And because for matrices, it's kind of obvious. So they just about cross matrix by low rank matrices. And for SDE, I mean, this seems to be easy. So you just approximate the wave function by a span of a low, uh, fewer number of basis functions and then evolve these basis functions. And, but it, t it turns out that it's slightly tricky, so that's uh, what, I mean, what our work tries to do. Okay, so I, I will skip the details, but I mean, what we call it stochastic dynamical low rank approximation, which also has some connection. I mean, back then there was people interested in UQ, I mean, interested in uh, solving very large systems of stochastic SD, so that it was uh, some applications there as well. Okay, so uh, yeah, I will skip the details, but I mean, so we can derive some equations and so on. So maybe let me, uh, Stop at the slides, which is sort of, I think, uh, kind of give some connections of all these different topics. And this is actually a picture, figure made by uh, Yu when uh, he wrote the thesis. And because he has done so many works that it's very hard to summarize what he, I mean, how much uh, things that he has achieved. But I mean, anyway, so that this is a thing that, I mean, his interest, like, I mean, what kind of at intersection, so that, I mean, we are really here that in the linear blood world, but. I mean, of course, there was a huge connection with the classical Monte Carlo sampling algorithms, Langevin, and under them Langevin, and things like that. And then there was also more advanced sampling algorithms classically, so that maybe it's interesting to think about. I mean, some of, of course, the quantum Q sampling version of these things has been well understood, but for the thermal state, maybe there are some interesting questions to ask. And then from the uh, analysis point of view, I mean, so that, I mean, for example, the convergence, acidicity of these things and the exponential decay would be, I think, is a quite interesting problem. And then maybe it's right now a good time for young people to think about these questions. Okay, thanks for attention.